It's time to ignite your soul and unlock your full potential. Join us on Beneath the Helmet, the podcast exploring firefighters' health and wellness. Hosted by retired fire chief Arjuna George, our podcast is the perfect place to start your journey towards becoming the best version of yourself. So come on, let's join the conversation and find out what sets your soul on fire. All right, welcome back, everyone. This is episode number 13, good old Lucky 13. Today I'm joined with a fellow fire service veteran, a leader, an educator, and the author of the book, The Fire Assessment Center 360. Today's guest is Chief Freddy Fernandez. In this episode, Chief Freddy's going to share some very important key nuggets that come out of his book about promotional testing. What we focus the most on in this interview is preparing the self for the stressful journey of promotional exams. Taking care of self will only give you the best outcome to success. If you are thinking of joining the fire service or have ambitions to rise through the ranks, Chief Freddy's book and his services that he has might be exactly what you're looking for. I hope you pull some important nuggets out of this great interview that will help you excel in whatever is next for you. This podcast is sponsored by Silver Arrow Coaching and Consulting, burnout and resilience coaching for high performers, specializing in coaching firefighters and fire chiefs. For more information on how Silver Arrow Coaching can support you, visit silverarrowco.com. That's www.silverarrowco.com. So please enjoy this episode with Chief Freddie Fernandez as he shares some tools and techniques for positioning yourself to land the job or that well-deserved promotion. This is a great conversation with Chief Freddie. Until next time, stay well. All right. Welcome back, everyone. We got Freddie Fernandez, Fire Chief Freddie Fernandez with us today and I feel very fortunate to speak with him. So welcome to the show, Freddie, and thanks for sharing your knowledge and your wisdom and your nuggets today. I'm so excited to be here. I'm so excited to chat with you, have a conversation. I think we have a lot to share with our listeners, and I think we're both just so passionate about trying to help others. So I'm just honored to be a guest on your show. Likewise, I'm honored to have you on the show. Chief Fernandez, tell us a little bit of your background, your story, and what brought you to your niche of testing and assessments and your new book as well. That's great. Thank you for that opportunity. I grew up in Miami, born and raised, Cuban parents that migrated to the United States. I was born in Miami, raised in Miami. And from a young age, I always thought that being a firefighter would be a great career, a great job. Quite frankly, it's because there were two careers that got to ride on the back and stand up on the back of a truck. So you either had to be a firefighter or a garbage collector. And the smell of the back of the garbage truck wasn't the most pleasant. So I decided to go the firefighter route. But all kidding aside, there have been quite a few events. I had witnessed firefighters working, crews working, and I just said, man, that would be great to be able to help uh, other people. So as I got out of high school, I immediately started the application route, started trying to learn more about the profession. And I was very fortunate to get hired at age 20 with the city of Miami, which happens to be where I grew up. Coincidentally, a lot of the fire chase I worked at throughout my 32 years in the city were stations that were next to the park, next to the junior high that I attended. I literally worked at a fire station next door to the junior high I attended. So I got to work in the communities that, that I grew up in. I got to work at the fire station right next to the schools that I attended. But over the 32 years, I was always very passionate about taking every training opportunity. So every class I could take, and I was always trying to grow and strive to, to basically just reach that self-fulfillment. So I became a paramedic very early in my career. I became a fire lieutenant in 1988, a captain in 1993, where I was the captain of a large fire station with 15 personnel. And we also did scuba dive reps. You can imagine living in Miami, we have a lot of water. In 1999, I promoted to chief. And that's where the journey into the test prep started. For the 15 years prior to that, I had worked on my days off at the local community college. I taught police officer, EMS, and fire with the three different campuses. And I just really passionate about creating and sharing information. In 1998, I took my first team assessment center and I scored number one. And you probably think to yourself, wow, that's great. You got promoted. No, I didn't get promoted. And the reason was that there were no openings on that test. Nobody retired. So the next year I had to test the second time and that just fueled my fire even more to that first number one score wasn't a fluke. And I was fortunate with a lot of time and effort, a lot of great study partners and friends that we worked together to score number one again and get promoted. But that's where all of my colleagues started saying, hey, Freddie, you need to train people. You obviously know what you're doing here. 
And that's how this was born. So out of a negative, start something positive. So in 1999, I started training people for assessment centers, like most firefighters doing it as a second side gig. And in 2009, I got promoted to deputy fire chief, working directly under the fire chief. And that's where yeah, I struggled, try to keep the business going. And I brought on a partner at that time, Chief David John. And we were able to expand and keep the business going until I fully retired from the department in 2014. And now I do this full time. And this is just a passion. A lot of people say, Freddie, you do this seven days a week. I go, yeah, but it doesn't feel like work. And I learn from my trainees. They learn from me. And then I'm very rewarded. Once a week, twice a week, I get an email from somebody. I got one this morning. Hey, congratulations. Chief. Thank you so much for helping me. I got promoted. So Freddie, do you mind if I call you Freddie? I, I love it when everybody calls me Freddie or Pete nice. Freddie. I never like to be called by my last name or <laughs> sure or anything like that, even though I call a lot of people sure. It's a pretty cool name, Freddie Fernandez. I like it. I like it. And so after all this, you went through and you published a book, The 360 Assessment. Yeah, what well, I've been, over the last 24 years at this point, I have been training personnel all over the country, all different ranks in Canada as well, on how to achieve success in the assessment center world. Now, about 10, 15 years ago, I actually wrote an outline for the book and I had an idea for some chapters, some different topics. That life gets in the way, you're busy, a lot of things are going on and it's not dormant for a while. And then right around when COVID hit in the early part of 2020, I said, hey, I'm going to start working on the book now because I figured my training would slow down and quite the opposite happened. My training actually got busier. So I kept scribbling ideas, notes. I just had a notebook and every now and then I'd scribble some notes in a book. And then finally late in 2022, I said, that's it. I am going to work on this every day. So I just set aside two hours a day to start working on the book and start now taking all of these spots, all of these ideas and putting it into some semblance of order. And six months later, I was able to finish the book and I'm very proud of it because it's not really like any other book that's out there. The book really deals a lot about self-development, working on yourself first. And I think that's where we so much align and that we have to look at everything holistically. It's not just hit it really hard and get promoted, but at what expense? Is it going to be the expense of your family, your relationship, your kids, your health? So that's what, what the book starts with is always work on preparing yourself and then focus on preparing for the assessment center. So I, I think I'm sharing a lot of information in the book that'll be valuable to people, whether they're testing or not. But obviously the key demographic or the key avatar reader for the book would be somebody that's got a promotion exam coming up in the fire service. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah, it's a great resource. Did you find for yourself going through the promotion process that yourself was not as crisp or as healthy as you wanted? Is that kind of what sparked the first couple of chapters about self? I'll tell you a story of one of the things that I actually cover, and I talk about it from a open and honest perspective. I talk about exercise and I talk about staying in focus with your exercise, your eating habits, your sleeping habits. I have a whole section on sleeping habits as well. But the story that I share is when I started studying for my first lieutenant exam, this is way back in 1987. So I was very young, 24 years old, but like I said, I was very focused on that process as well. So I set aside about eight to 10 hours a day to study. So mind you, if you're studying eight to 10 hours a day, you really have time for nothing else. So I just, I gave up exercising. I gave up doing some hobbies and things that I enjoyed. Now, the last six weeks before the actual exam, I took it off. I did not work. I did a lot of exchanges of time, fill in vacation to make sure I had six full weeks of uninterrupted study. So the good news is I did well on that test also. The bad news is that I still remember the date, December 10th, 1987. It was a shift day, but I was allowed relief to go take the test. We took the test and I get back to the fire station around three in the afternoon. So I take my key, I open my locker and I pull out a pair of pants. And in the door, pictures of my wife and everything. And as I go to put the pants on, they don't fit. They don't fit. There was no possible way I could buckle the pants. So I remember closing the locker and just confirming it with my locker. And then I said to myself, your wife's picture's there. Your key opened the locker. It has to be with the locker. So the moral of the story for me was I can't let this happen again. You have to incorporate good, healthy exercise, good, healthy eating habits. And I didn't do that. It was the, the heaviest I've ever been in my life. 
So that's why I've shared that in the book about trying to make sure you maintain those healthy habits throughout the process. And I'm assuming from our conversations and from my point of view, it's not just about physical fitness. It's about mental fitness as well. Now, what's your thoughts on that? Oh, hundred percent that because if you're not mentally in the right frame of mind, then you may be putting hours in studying, but they're not productive hours. So one of the things that I've always struggled with, and after 32 years of being a first responder is sleeping. So I, I have a whole section here, a lot of recommendations on how to sleep. And I always try to tell the students that you have to get to a point where if you feel you're not productive, take a break, go jogging, go to a movie. I remember when I was studying for that exam that I told you now where, where I gained all the weight, I just didn't feel healthy. I didn't feel invigorated some days and I was too young. I didn't have anybody to coach me on what to do. So that's what I tried to share in the book is that if you're not working at your peak and you're not eating healthy, then yeah, you might be studying, but you're really just running like a hamster and a hamster wheel. Yeah. I assume if you're in this study mode, you lock yourself away in your bedroom or whatever and start studying away and you order pizza and you try to drink some Red Bulls to keep you awake and extra coffee. That's doing nothing for your well-being and your focus and your productivity, really. What do you Actually, I think it's counterproductive in the sense that you have this full sense, oh, I did six hours today. I did eight hours today. But was it really effective? So I like to use the analogy. I like to use a lot of sports analogies. And one that I use is golf. If you go to the range and you order 10 buckets of range balls and you're striking ball after ball till your fingers are bleeding and you got blisters on your hand, did you really accomplish something? Or would it be better to hit one or two buckets under a watchful eye of a coach, maybe videotape it and watch it? So that's the process that I think is important that you understand that it isn't about the total hours you put in, but the quality of the hours you put in. Yeah. It kind of makes me think about the 10,000 hour rule where you have to put in a lot of dedicated, focused time on a subject. Did you find in your research or your own experiences that 10,000 hour rule is appropriate and is correct? Or is that false in your opinion? I knew we really had an hour rule per se. And the people that kind of gave me some advice early in my career, they put it in terms of months. And they said, you need to study for a written test about six months. Now they did say about eight hours a day. Now, what I found as well is if you're studying for a straight written exam, in order to get eight hours of actual in the book time, it takes closer to 12 hours in the day mm -hmm. because you can't study without break. You can't study without stretching. I think that sometimes it's better to focus on the quality rather than the quantity. So those numbers are good goals, but we people with our personalities maybe need to be careful that we're overdoing it to hit that goal and not really understanding the cause and effect, what it's causing to us health-wise, what it's causing to us relationship-wise. And is it really worth it to hit this arbitrary number as opposed to just try to get the best quality you can in your test prep, whether it's a written test, an assessment center, or a board test, there is a point of no return. There's a point of diminishing return. Yeah, diminishing return. I think the word I was thinking about was deliberate practice, right? So very focused practice, sometimes less is more. Just like the, like your analogy of hitting the golf balls, sometimes less, more focused, more concentrated work is a better outcome than trying to get in 12, 15, 20 hours of studying. Yeah. I remember one day in particular that I was really feeling good that day and I, I kept studying and studying. I think I got about 12 book hours that day, which took 16, 17 hours of the day. And then the next day I had nothing. I had absolutely nothing. So it just, uh, in hindsight, it was a bad idea. The day that I was doing it, I said, oh my gosh, this is great. Look how many hours I got in today. And the next day I got zero because I just could, the next day, I, every time I looked at a page of the book, I couldn't focus. Yeah, I guess you could switch this over to physical fitness as well. If you go hardcore on physical fitness, go to the gym every day for four hours a day, there's going to be a point where you're like, you're too sore to go to the gym and you start losing that momentum and maybe even quit going to the gym because you're so sore. That's an excellent analogy. Another chapter, another area I wrote in the book was about trying to manage your time. So in an assessment center or a board setting, clocks are just a huge part of it because almost every scenario is time, whether it's a counseling session, an end basket, an emergency operations scenario, they're all time and the time adds a lot of pressure. So the book talks a lot about how to manage your time at touch setting. 
but I dedicated a whole other section to personal time management. And I have some research that I did that's only tips on how to be more efficient with your time, how to calendar everything you're doing and look for time wasters. I also have a section, I call it engaging your village, where now where you can do this for a short period of time. You can't do it for a long period, but can somebody help you cut your grass? Can somebody help you do your groceries? Can somebody help you run some errands? So maybe a neighbor could help you with your grass one day. Maybe a family member could go do some errands for you. Maybe you can get groceries delivered instead of going to buy groceries. So my point in that chapter was that you could buy a couple of hours here and there, say three, four hours a week that you save over time, it adds up. And maybe those three hours is a time that you just take a break or you go watch a movie to get yourself out of that stressful mindset for a while. So in the book, we talk a lot about time management from a testing perspective, but also time management from a personal perspective. And you can't be successful on any promotion exam, in my opinion, without a support network. And I give a shout out to my wife. My wife helped me on all of my promotional exams. And without that support, especially once we had kids, without that support, it just couldn't have been, it couldn't have been possible. And unfortunately, I've heard stories where the testing process leads to divorces and uh, relational issues like that. So it's very important that before entering a process of trying to get promoted like that, that you have those discussions with your loved one. Great point. I love the village kind of concept. I think that's important. Because I don't think many people think outside of their family as their support network. Like you say, their neighbor could be cutting a lawn for them instead for that week while they're trying to study. And a great aunt or an uncle could watch the kids for a day. And it's a good concept. I like that. Yeah. And I think that helps with the stress. And then mm -hmm. if you, when you're successful, those people feel like they have part of it too. And they, they'll feel gratified that they were able to be a part of helping you succeed in your career endeavor. I like that. So what kind of tips do you have for productive and efficient studying? What kind of tips would you like to share with our listeners on maybe strategies that really allow you to focus and remember the information? One of the things that I talk a lot about is in the old board assessment center world, there's something called dimension. And that's how people are evaluating. That's scoring criteria. And dimensions could be things like planning and organizing, interpersonal skills, problem identification, analyzing, decision-making, stress tolerance. Those are just some examples of different dimensions. But one of the things that I tell the students is that the most important dimension of all is something called information analysis. What that means is that when you're given a scenario, let's say, for example, in this case, a tactical scenario, since we're both ex chief, we use that example. If you have a structure fire and the wind is blowing 20 miles an hour from the west, so that means the wind is blowing from west to east, if you misinterpret that wind direction, now everything's going to go wrong at that point. Your staging will be wrong. Your apparatus placement will be wrong. Your ventilation profile, which exposure you protect first. All of those things will be wrong by a simple mistake. So I talk a lot about focusing on information analysis, but also focusing on the dimension, understanding how you're being evaluated. So I'm a big basketball fan, and I'm going to get a plug in right now since at the time that we're shooting this, the heater in the playoffs. And for my Canadian brothers, the Florida Panthers are also in the playoffs, very close to the Stanley Cup final. But in the book, I share the story of Ray Allen in the 2013 NBA finals against the San Antonio Spurs. So it was a very high leverage moment in the game. There's only seconds left. The Miami Heat's losing by three. And you may have heard of somebody named LeBron James. He takes a three-pointer and he misses. Chris Bosch gets the rebound. Now, Ray Allen starts to backpedal without ever looking down, without ever blinking for a second. Bosch passes it in the ball, and he shoots, and he scores. That three ties the game. But if he takes one fewer backpedal, it's a two, and they lose. If he takes one more backpedal, he steps out of bounds, and they lose. So what I tell my students is that you have to understand the rules, understand clock management, understand how the process is going to work. And I use that analogy because Ray Allen's one of the greatest players and the shooters, especially in the history of the NBA. But what he said when he was asked about that, he said, I practiced that so many times, it was automatic. I didn't have to think about it. I knew exactly where I was standing. I didn't have to look down. So that's part of the process as well. And that's why the book starts with, do not prepare for the assessment center. And when I say that to students, they'll look at me sometimes and they'll go, are you crazy? I want to prepare for the assessment center. I says, yeah, I get that, but you got to prepare yourself first. And that. Ray Allen didn't prepare for that moment. He prepared for years for that moment. 
So I like to use those sports analogies and I like to tell the students that yes, understand the game, understand the rule. I love that. Definitely a basketball fan myself and watched the Lakers game last night and where they lost to the Nuggets. So yeah, that's going to be an interesting playoff. Yeah. So hopefully that Miami Heat can beat the Celtics. They're up 3-0. They're playing tonight. As a matter of fact, and if they win, then it'll be the Heat and the Denver Nuggets. But yeah. our other team down here in South Florida is hopefully going to make the Stanley Cup Finals as well. So how's that about the team from South Florida playing <laughs> a team of a sport that was originally from Canada? The original six yep. NHL teams were all Canadian. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Beautiful. I like the sports analogies incorporated into learning and training. So what kind of tips do you have for people who go through this process and end up not being successful? What, how do they recover from that? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and it's interesting because a lot of the things that we're chatting about, I actually cover in the book. And one of them, as I talk in chapter two, it's called overcoming excuses and obstacles. And we all have obstacles. We all have challenges. There isn't one amongst us that doesn't deal with day-to-day life challenges. But one of the things that I talk about is previous failure. And sometimes people get despondent. They get upset that they haven't been successful. And what I try to impart on this is that every time that you're preparing for a test or you take a test, whether you get promoted or not, you're learning, you're growing. And if you're working on yourself and you're working on good, let's say, communication skills, let's say good interpersonal dynamic skills to run your counseling sessions, good presentation skills, how to do a training session, for example, those skill sets should still reside inside of you. And even though you may not achieve that next position, you're greater and more valuable at the position you're in now. So I like to tell the students that, yep, you want to get promoted 100%. I want you to be number one. I want you to be the top dog on that list. But there are some things that may be out of our control. You are being evaluated by other human beings. There is some subjectivity to the test. But if you're preparing good ICF skills, let's say NIMS ICS, or good administrative skills, how to run an in-basket, you can apply that every day in the position you're in. The thing I like to emphasize is that some people mistake a management position or a title with leadership. And the things couldn't be more diametrically opposed. A leader has nothing to do with a title or a position. A leader has to do with modeling behavior, leading by example, mentoring, coaching, guiding others. So I, I have a whole section in the book that talks also about mentoring. So what I try to do really in the book is, yes, I want my students to get promoted. I want the readers to get promoted. There's no doubt about that. But I want them to grow. I want them to grow personally. I want them to grow professionally. So the advantage of taking this approach is if you get promoted, great. That's awesome. But if you don't get promoted, you're still going to be better. You're going to be better at everything that you do. So that's one way to, to deal with that failure component. Because as we know in the fire service, it's very competitive. You're not competing against random people. You're competing against highly trained, highly motivated personnel. So there's no failure per se. Sometimes they're just not opening. The timing isn't there. You may score in the top two or three of a test and they're just not an opening like what happened to me in 1998. Sometimes there are factors out of your control. For example, I just spoke to a trainee the other day and at his agency, they give extra points for military and they give extra points for advanced degrees. He doesn't have military, doesn't have advanced degree. So he's already a couple of points behind somebody else. And I said, listen, control what you can control. Yeah. That's an important rule in life, let alone doing an assessment or going through the promotion process. Only worry about, only stress about, only deal with the stuff that's in your control. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I noticed there'll be a right shoulder in your bookcase. You have one of my favorite quotes, which is carpe diem. <laughs> and to show you that's one of my favorite quotes, I actually have a type oh, no of no arm. Oh, beautiful. No. So yes. that's one of the things that I try to live with. Now, another tattoo that I have is the word serenity. And serenity has to do with the serenity of prayer, which of course is God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. So that's my mantra when I get stressed out. That's my mantra when I think, okay, I don't know what to do next, or this situation is too challenging to handle. So I just cite that mantra to myself, and I repeat that prayer to myself, and I go, okay, can you handle it? Can you do anything about this right now? And if you can't, you just have to take a step back. Unfortunately, we know these things as adults. We know these things as human beings, but sometimes when we're immersed in that situation, we need reminders. Yeah, I think like symbolic little quotes like uh, Carp Diem and you have it tattooed on your arm, it's like a nice little trigger for you to stay grounded to that concept 
that you're following, right? So it's good to have symbols around. Symbols could be on your body or they could be little plaques or posters or whatever that is, but someone to keep that in the forefront of your mind. I think that's important as well. Yeah. And I'm a big fan also in visualization. So I like to visualize the outcome. I like to visualize stuff. So one of the things that I used to do study for my exams is actually picture the memorandum or the official notice that comes out, the bulletin that comes out listing the results on a promotion exam. We've all been there. Anybody that's listening to this podcast, she's a firefighter know what it's like to see that list come out and the crush when you look at it and you're hoping your name is at the top. And then if your name is at the bottom, you flip it over to see if maybe you have it upside down. And, uh, but that's part of the process. And we have to learn how to navigate those waters. And every challenge that you have, is just an opportunity to grow. So building on that, what kind of strategies or tips do you have for people who are successful and how they can actually celebrate that? Because I think there's a lot of, I've seen it in the past, people who get a position or get a promotion, maybe feel a little awkward to celebrate or, and it's not boast in front of their brothers and sisters, but how do they celebrate that success personally? Maybe that's in their own privacy or whatever that looks like. Any thoughts? Well, I think it's okay to celebrate, but especially to thank those that helped you. Like I said, I have a whole section of the book on mentors. I reference a lot of my mentors in the book. But thank those people that helped you celebrate along with those people. But whether you're a lieutenant, you're a captain, you always have to understand that we exist for the benefit of others. My fire chief would always say that it's at every graduation, every promotional ceremony, retirement, whatever the situation was, my fire chief would say, this is the fire service. We exist to provide service to others. So I think that helps us to stay grounded. Little celebration, yeah, a little celebration is good, but get over yourself. And then remember that you exist to provide service to others. You don't know more than your crew. Uh, you should always attempt to surround yourselves with people smarter than you. One of my favorite leadership coaches, if you could see my book case, there's at least 20, 25 John Maxwell books. At every book, at least once, some twice, some three times. But when John Maxwell said, this is my favorite of all of his quotes, which he's got so many quotes that are my favorites, but this is my most favorite. Nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. So that is really how to carry yourself, how to lead yourself. And if you do that, then you'll have great relationships with, with your crew, with your personnel, and you get the most out of them. If you're leading and nobody's walking behind you, you're just out for a walk. You can't be a leader without having a follower. And if you keep that mindset, yeah, you back to your original question. You can have a little celebration. You can be happy, proud of yourself. But once you get over that, remember that it's all about your subordinates, it's all about the citizens out there. And without the subordinates, without the citizens, you're nobody. Yeah, it goes back to that mentality that people remember how you made them feel versus what you said. Yeah, that's and, a big quote. I believe that's from Maya Angelou, is it, yeah. uh, the poet. And that's one of my, another favorite quote of mine is that you got to, they, you got to remember how they're going to remember how you made them feel, not exactly what you said, not what words you did, what action to, but how they felt at the end of the day. So to tie it back to the book, one of the things we talk about is if you have a citizen complaint, you have a citizen coming in, let's say one of our firefighters were rude or we took too long to get there or something like that. The first thing you have to do is validate their concern. Hey, I'm sorry you feel that way. If it had to do with a medical transport, maybe they who didn't treat their, their loved one. Okay. How's your loved one? If they had a fire in their home, are you okay? Do you need a place to stay? Always think about the other. And then even once you get a complaint from a citizen, if you put them at ease and you let them know that you care about them, then you might be able to find middle ground on that complaint. But if you come in defensive, if you don't acknowledge they had a fire or they had an emergency or an accident or whatever it was, then you can't establish that before. And then it becomes an adversarial conversation instead of a conversation we're trying to find middle ground. We know that citizens sometimes will have a complaint and maybe unfounded, maybe it's their perspective, but at least give them the opportunity to share that and understand that you want to connect with them on a personal level, then connect with them at the fire chief level. I'm sure you dealt with that when you were a fire chief many times. But the most influential fire chief of our careers is Alan Bunicini from Phoenix. And he was just so brilliant because Chief Bunicini made it simple. He made everything simple. And when it came to customer service, yeah. so I quote Chief Bunicini in here in the book because 
he not only was the guru when it came to the customer service, but if people remember that are old enough to remember, he's the one that transitioned us and he taught us how to use ICS for structure fire. So that's something that I talk about in the book. And those are some resources that I talk about in always trying to prepare yourself. That's, it's funny you say that because the whole time you were talking there, I was thinking this is Chief Bernusini. That's the picture I had in my head. And then when you mentioned his name, I was like, yep, that's exactly right. That's exactly yeah, what I was Unfortunately, thinking. he passed away a couple of years ago, but his, mm-hmm. legacy, his legacy lives on because everywhere you go, people, and at some point, this will transcend 20, 30 years from now, people won't remember who Chief Bernersini was. But as long as people like you and I are around, we keep throwing his name out there. And more importantly, the things that he stood for. And whenever you speak, whenever I speak to a Phoenix firefighter, I'll ask him, really, really, did you guys really do all of these things that he said in the book? He says, we did that and more. The book is just the tip of the iceberg of the things they did, but you were a fire chief. I was not very high in the organization. Sometimes an organization, all we're focused on is getting the unit back in service, getting the unit back in service. And Chief Gunashini's focus was, hey, if you have to stay out of service an hour, so be it. I have other units that'll cover, but we, let's take care of this person. And that's something that's a challenge when you're a fire chief, or when you have the pressures and the stressors that you have to provide the service. But It's got to be a paradigm or a culture that develops in the organization. And once the organization understands this culture, it just becomes secondary. Yeah. I'm hoping that tradition, that culture, that stories about Bruno Seedy will live on for many more years because he is incredible. Jumping into interviews, um, does your book talk about any strategies that are different than for the written assessment? Any strategies there that you'd like to share? Yeah, I have a whole chapter dedicated to the interview and the two areas that I Split the preparation side of that is self-preparation and, and organizational preparation. So I strongly urged the candidate long before the exam to become an expert on themselves. So not just the resume, not just the curriculum vitae, but perhaps getting a list of all the committees you've worked on, all the projects you've worked on, maybe some special calls you've been on, and becoming an expert on yourself, and then also researching the agency, mission, vision, core values, and motto learning about the, all the units, how many responses they go on, what the response zone is, where the target hazards are. So becoming an expert first on yourself and secondly on the organization. But then what I teach on with my students, they struggle in talking about themselves, which is a great aptitude to have as a human. It's nobody likes somebody boasting, brags, full narcissistic, but on an, an interview, you have to sell yourself. Number one, how does your skill set benefit the citizen? That's always my number one. So if you have experience as a tower lateral operator, how does it benefit the citizens? If you're a paramedic, how does it benefit the citizen? Number two, how does it benefit the agency? So how does it make the department better? Number three, how does it correlate to the duties of the position? So for instance, back to the tower ladder. If you were a former tower ladder driver, now you could help your up and coming firefighters if they want to become tower ladder drivers. Then the fourth thing is I want them to support everything with fact. So sometimes people in interview will say, I'm very motivated. I'm very dependable. I'm very conscientious. And whenever I hear that, I tell my students, time out. I won't allow you to say that unless you support it with a fact. That goes back to the research. So I'm very dependable. I've never been late in the last 10 years, something like that. I'm very motivated. I volunteer for the following committee. So you always support it with a fact. Like and then the fifth criteria that I told my students to look for is what I call separator. And this is where the research is so important on the front end. What I mean by a separator is what do you have that separates you from the other candidate? But I never let my students negatively talk about the other candidates. You're not allowed to do that. You can only build yourself up, but without talking negatively about somebody else. So in the interview phase, that's really what's most important is that first you start learning as much as you can about yourself and how your skill sets, experiences benefit those five categories I just talked about, and then learning about your agency. And the mission, vision, sometimes are models on the side of an apparatus. We'll see some core values, let's say professionalism, courteousness, whatever, integrity. But how do you live those values? How do you demonstrate those values? So one of the books that I cite here is from Chief Escuso from Step Up and Lead. And one of the things you said there is that if you can't lead yourself, you can't possibly lead others. And then I also cite from Chief Carpluck, our friend Chief Carpluck, some of the benefits and things that he talks about leading. So when you get these sources that talk about different leadership, they always come back to trust. And that's what I try to ground the interview on is that 
yes, we're going to talk about ourselves and we have to extol our virtues. We have to sell our experiences, certifications, our education, et cetera. But don't make it about you, make it about the other. Wow. Those are some good nuggets in there. And I think your book sounds like it's full of knowledge and wisdom for anyone to excel in this fire service world. That's a pretty amazing. Yeah. I, I think it's a great resource because it's a resource that's grounded in reality. It's grounded on experience. Everything that's in the book doesn't come from uh, some theoretical plate or, or some hypothesis. Everything is proven. I was very fortunate in writing my book, I quote over 45 di five different authors. And I quote authors that are not in the fire service. I quote obviously fire service authors, but I quote Chief Lasky, Chief Salka, Chief Carpluck, Chief Pescucho. I quote the Navy SEALs. I quote Eric Thomas, PhD, who's a big motivational speaker. People like Simon Sinek. I obviously quote the John Normans and the Fire Officer Principles book. So there's technical quotation. But there's a lot of areas on leadership. I have a section from my pastor at church. He did a sermon on mentoring and the value of mentoring. So I show how to establish mentoring relationships, how to make mentoring relationships effective. So there's even a little checklist here on if you're looking for a mentor, what to look for. If you're going to mentor somebody, what are some tips to make that mentoring relationship effective? So even though, like, for instance, in the last question about the interview, I told you how to apply these things in interview setting, but in reality, you can apply it anywhere. And that's the beauty of it. That's what I wanted to try to get across in the book. Another thing that I think is important in the book for any potential reader to understand is that I'm sharing things that I've learned from others. These aren't things that, that I made up along the way. These are things that I've picked up from working with thousands of students over the last 24 years. Being able to work, I work with people in some agencies that have one fire station, five guys on duty, five gals or gals on duty. I work with others, like we just finished working with a lot of people from Houston. They have 4,000 firefighters. So I pick up something from everybody. I work with people from cold environments, hot, warm environments all over the country, up in Canada. I've worked with people from as far away as Alaska. So a lot of the tips that are in the book are just things that I've picked up over the years from our brothers and sisters. Um, and I've been able to kind of put it together in a package that I think you can apply on any promotion exam. Awesome. I think that's the beauty of the fire service, isn't it? The fire service is just full of wealth, knowledge, and there seems to be a time in people's careers where that knowledge is shared for free in books, in podcasts, and websites. It's just a wealth of information that's so readily available to everyone. So it's pretty, pretty impressive culture that we yeah, have. Yeah, there's another quote, and I think they use this a lot in some of the recovery programs, but it's that you can only keep what you have by giving it away. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I found that everything that I give away, it comes back to me 20 fold. I learned much more from others. Another thing that I found through my career is that the nicer you are to people, the more nice people you run across. And it's really that mindset of the half full, half empty type of mindset. You can complain all you want about situations, but complaining isn't going to make it any better. You're going to show up in your path and you're going to walk, oh, where'd that person show up? They just show up and you'll find mentors. You'll find people that'll share information with you. And I've taken hundreds, if not thousands of classes throughout my career, but I can tell you that I pick up something from every class, pick up something from every interaction. And no matter how much you think you can always learn something new. And I try to have that open, hard, open mind concept of trying to learn something every day. Yeah, got that. We're definitely on the same page there. So you noted in some of your conversations in the past that one of the secret, secret weapons, I guess you could say, would be one-to-one -one coaching. Love to hear more because I'm a coach and I deal with firefighters and fire chiefs and helping them to be more resilient and beat burnout to excel in life. So I'd love to hear how coaching in your view is a secret weapon. I think coaching is really the secret weapon because there's other good books out there. There's a lot of good information, but until you learn how to apply it under prep or under threat, you really don't know how you're going to do when the stuff hits the fan proverbially be the day of the test. So in our coaching sessions, what we try to do is we try to put the student in the hot seat. We try to show them exactly what it's going to feel like. So we never do run a scenario without a clock running because every test is time. You just can't sit there and take two hours to do something. They're going to give you five or 10 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever the case may be. So we try to put them under that pressure. 
We try to also show them how they're going to be graded back to those dimensions I talked about earlier, planning and organizing, information analysis, time management, whatever. So we try to show them those dimensions and then we try to come up with some systems. So one of the authors that I quote, Gordon Graham, and he talks about prime decision-making and how we go about as humans making decisions. So it's very important that we understand human beings, how we make decisions. So basically there's four things of learning. The first stage is called unconscious incompetent. In other words, I don't know what I don't know. And I don't need to know. I don't, I don't know I have a need for it. The next stage is conscious incompetent. I realized I should learn how to do something. I need to learn how to do something. So now I realize what I don't know. The next phase is called conscious competent. I can do it, but I've got to think about it. It isn't secondary yet. It isn't rote memory. I got to go through certain steps. And then the fourth phase is unconscious competent. I can do it with my eyes closed at three o'clock in the morning in a dark alley with all hell breaking loose. So that's part of the coaching process, trying to get you close to that last phase where now you can apply what you've learned. What I told my students is you have to have a format and a system to follow, but here's their deal with an assessment center. Your system or format has to work on any event. You can't pick and choose the problem. You can't pick and choose the scenario. It has to work under pressure. You can't call a timeout. There are no timeouts the day of the assessment center. When in basketball, every time a team is making a big run, the coach will call a timeout to try to tamp it down the momentum. You can't do it in the session center. And then the third thing is the clock. The clock breaks for no one. So to get to the point in the coaching session, that's where we try to get you to, to where, you know, when you show up at the test, you're like, hey, bring it. I don't care if it's a one-story house, a two-story house. In your case, an ice rescue, in our case, a water rescue, a trench rescue a mass casualty incident, it doesn't matter what it is. If I have to train on a self-contained breathing apparatus with a thermal imaging camera, so what? Bring it. That's where we want to get to in our development, our process. And I think that's what the coaching does. The coaching puts people over the top. A lot of my students will call me after the test and I say, hey, were you nervous? And they go, nervous? No, I was way harder working with you than doing it on the test. So that's really the advantage of coaching. The other advantage is that you're being coached by seasoned veteran people. Myself, I've got 40 years in the fire service. The other coaches that work with me on my team, they've got all at least 30 years in the fire service. They're all chief fire officers. They've all tested for assessment centers multiple times. So you don't have anybody coaching you hypothetically. Everything is something that they've applied and they've done over and over again. I think that's very important. Yeah. Power of coaching. I think it changes lives. Like you say, you can use that visualization as well as a key part of that coaching. I know I'm a big fan of coaching with visualization and, and having the client, the firefighter go through and see that, like you say, see that thing on the wall with your name on it, number one, or see your name in the front of the paper saying that you're the next fire chief in town or whatever that looks like. Yeah, and I know pretty powerful. looking at you from reading and reviewing and researching the coaching that you do, it's really about establishing a connection as well. You have to have a connection with your client. In this case, the student that we're working with, that student, we have to establish a connection. So one of the things we like to do early on in the coaching is learn more about their agency. So are they that two station, two unit department, or are they a department with 500 people on duty and apparatus everywhere? But what are the key responses in that? So earlier, when you asked me about the interviews, I talked about preparing yourself, learning about yourself, but learning about the agency. We do that even more with every exercise in the coaching session. We try to learn what are the issues in that agency? Are they dealing with harassment issues, hazing issues, staffing issues? One of the things that we've been dealing a lot with the last couple of months, obviously, or the last couple of years, is a lot of mandatory overtime. After COVID, a lot of departments lost people that haven't been able to hire fast enough. So I'm getting a lot of my senior to tell me, man, I'm really getting burned out because of all the mandatory overtime and the stressors that it causes at home when you're gone for a whole block period of time, you're not sleeping. I think most firefighters if they can pick up an overtime shift here and there, they'll pick it up. That's how we are. Make a little extra cash. Maybe it pays a vacation or it paid for a kid's college tuition for a semester or something. But when you have overtime that you volunteered for, you've scheduled, you've been, you planned for, that's easy. Or right, I should say it's yeah. easy. But when you're mandatory and your kid had a t-ball game that morning or your wife had an appointment here, and then you got to call and say, hey, mama, I'm not coming home this morning. I got mandatory. She's got to go to the appointment by herself or go to the 
will play by themselves. I think that's a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. It affects the home life, but also overtime is not meant to be an everyday thing. It's meant to be originally, it was meant to be a, an occasional extra time for your work. It shouldn't be a day-to-day episode for sure. Yeah. And that's an issue I've seen a lot recently in the last couple of years, where people are burnt out. They're getting tired. They're getting stressed out because of the mandatory overtime. And then it's actually before anybody that's listening who's more of an administrator, maybe making some of these decisions, there's a unintended consequence because now the more overtime you mandate, the more likely they're going to call out sick to recover. Mm. And then when they call out sick, guess what you just created? Another overtime cycle that's mandatory. So for the fire chiefs out there, the administrators out there, the budget people out there, it's very important to keep the departments fully staffed or as close to full staff as possible to prevent this overtime. And there's times that, you know, maybe there's an emergency or a lot of people are out on an illness or a vacation or something, and it causes some overtime. But like you said, it shouldn't be the norm. It should be the exception. Exactly. So as we come to a close here, what would be one key message that you'd love to share with our listeners about preparing yourself for life, for the fire service or a promotion process? So... I wish that at 60 years old that I am now, I knew this when I was 30 years old, but you don't know everything. Listen, listen. You learn so much more by listening. Kitty classes. I have another section in the book that talks about resources, podcasts, FDIC, Firehouse Expo, local conferences and conventions. Try to avail yourself of those. Budget them out. Don't just do it at the last minute. Plan. Plan a year. Plan five years ahead of time. Set your career goal. Any goal that isn't written and measurable, then it's just something here. It's a pipe dream. One of the things that we talk about in the book, how you attain things is by good, clear habits, not by writing goals down, but start building those good habits. Build those goals. Build what you're doing. Plan ahead. One thing that you'll find in the fire service is that you blink and the 20, 30 years have gone by. <laughs> so make the most of it each day. Now, promotion isn't for everyone because I help people get promoted and have this book for a change. It doesn't mean it's for everyone. If you feel that you're content in the position you are as a firefighter, as a driver operator, great. Just be a good one. Be a great driver operator. Be a good firefighter. Be a good paramedic. Lead from any position. So if you think that you're going to get promoted and all of a sudden you're going to become a leader, you and I need to have a long discussion because that's not about to happen. So remember that promotion is nice. It helps you make a bigger impact in organization. Certainly it has some financial benefits and pension benefits and things like that. But promote for the right reasons. Promote to make the organization better, to have a greater impact on your community. But if you're not willing to promote for those reasons, quite frankly, I personally don't want to help you get promoted. I want people to get promoted that, that are doing it for the right reason. Back to the, the initial statement I said, just be an open book. Be an open book. Learn. Get your coaches, get your mentors, learn from others, invest in yourself. It's not, a, it's not an expense when you hire a coach. It's not an expense when you go to a conference. It's an investment. It's not when you go to the store and you buy a sandwich. Yeah, 10 bucks, I got a sandwich. That you can measure what the 10 bucks catch you. But when you invest yourself, the payback is immeasurable. I'm so glad you said that because I truly think that some people consider coaching and mentoring and consulting and any kind of hired help as an expense when really it should be viewed as an investment because it's investing in your future, yourself, your progress, your leadership, everything. So yeah, I'm glad you said that. Yeah. I have one of my former students and I've been trying for a couple of years now to see if he wants to come work for me as a coach. He's from a small department, not really, not too small, but a department in the Bay area of California. And when he told me, this is five or six years ago, he said, I set aside $10,000 a year just for training and personal development. He set to the side. And I'm not saying that's the right number or the wrong number. That's just what he told me that he does every year. So he budgets this ahead of time. And he'll go to conferences. He'll hire different coaches and mentors. But now he's a high-ranking official in his department. But he's not just a high-ranking person by title. He's somebody that people look up to. He's somebody that is making a huge impact in his organization, but he pays himself first. He develops himself first. And then go figure, every promotion exam, he scored number one on, he scored right. high on. But that's the concept of the book, is prepare yourself first. The results will come on the test. But if you see a, a bulletin come out, hey, the promotion exam in 90 days, 
And that's the day you start preparing, mm. you're way behind the curve. Yeah, I've seen that way too often. The posting comes yeah, out, oh, I better go to the gym today. <laughs> yep. yep, definitely. So how can people learn more about Chief Freddy? Where can they find you on the internet? And where can they purchase a copy of your book? The book is available everywhere. The title of the book is Fire Center 360. If you put that in Amazon or any of the other search engines, they'll be there. I have my own website, fireassessmentcenterprep.com. That's run by myself and my partner, Chief John. We have a staff of, of chiefs that help train people from all around the country. So at fireassessmentcenterprep.com, you can get more information. If you want to learn more about the book, you can send me an email. You can contact me through the website, and I'd be happy to share any information I have with you. Fantastic. Chief Freddie, it's been an honor to get to know you. I obviously just met you recently, and we have some mutual colleagues in the fire service. And it's a real honor to get to know you and to hear the, a different perspective on testing, because I think testing sometimes, from my previous experience, has been very analytical, very technical, and leaving the component of self out of it. And I think that's where your book stands out from the crowd of dealing with self, because I think, really, there's nothing, you're not going to make any advancements in life or your career if your state, your being is not in prime operating condition. So I thank you for that. And I thank you for sharing your wisdom and your nuggets with us today. I really appreciate it. Great. Thank you so much for having me again. I wish you nothing but good health for you and your family as well. You as well. All right. Stay well, everyone. Thanks for watching. Thank you for tuning in to Beneath the Helmet. We hope that this podcast has provided you with valuable insights into the world of firefighters' health and wellness. Remember, caring for your physical, mental, and spiritual well-being is crucial to achieving optimal performance. Join us next time on Beneath the Helmet for more inspiring conversations. Until then, stay well.